Uh, welcome to Vancouver Retro Gaming Expo, at least the end of it, and uh, the talk on uh, homebrew game development. And uh, uh, my name is James O'Brien. I'm a filmmaker and I'm also the host of Zero Page Homebrew um, on uh, Twitch and YouTube. And I would like to welcome each of the panelists. Uh, David Galloway, also known as DJ Mips on Atari Age, uh, who has made Mega Man 2600, Blip Football, and Arcade Pong. Welcome. Uh, Daniel Savage, who has made Wizard of the Board on N64 and Lunar Assault 64. And Brian Provinciano, uh, who made Grand Theft Endo, Re Retro City Rampage, and Shakedown Hawaii. Yeah. So we're going to be talking all about homebrew and uh, why we do it and what it is about and how it's made. And uh, I just want to uh, read a little bit about what I think homebrew is. <laughs> this is a little write-up I did in a homebrew book. Uh, I said, homebrew is the umbrella term for new video games made for classic consoles. Just as the term homebrew is used for people who enjoy making beer in the comfort of their own home, the programs that homebrew coders create are often conceived of and created by one person in their spare time. But unlike a limited batch of beer, these games can be enjoyed by everyone. When talking specifically about the Atari 2600, <laughs> software made after the disc discontinuation of the console in 1992 is considered a homebrew. For the 2600, homebrew usually comes in the form of original games, ports of older arcade games, hacks of existing titles, or even non-interactive demos. So that's just my definition of homebrew, and I know there's lots of different definitions of homebrew, but we'll probably get into that. Um, maybe you can introduce uh, each of yourselves and a little bit of background of programming and why you got into homebrew. I'll start, okay. <clears throat> so when I was a kid in the 1970s, there were two big important things that happened uh, to me, for me. The uh, Star Wars kit was released in the, in the theater and the uh, uh, Atari 2600 was, was released. And I, I, although I was able to see Star Wars, I actually wasn't allowed to have an Atari 2600. So I think that's where the, the real formative idea that I, I wanted to make my own video games came from because I, I, had a I was allowed to have a computer. And so I was able to, you know, with a computer, I was able to start making the games that I wanted to play that my friends had that I couldn't get. And I wasn't allowed to even have games either, like on my, on my home computer. It was just for, meant to be for homework or, or you know, that sort Serious of thing. Serious stuff only. Serious stuff only. We so. bought this for homework no, for you. No games, no games. So I had to, so basically I, I started, that's how I started making games on my own. And uh, I had an Apple II computer and I even, like I went to the point of actually getting a Atari cartridge. I managed to get a cartridge from a friend, and I made a made a, a board on my Apple II that actually read the cartridge. And mm -hmm. I, with the, I had the express intent, and I was like about thirteen years old, fourteen years old, to make my own Atari twenty six hundred games. So that was nice. so I actually started tried to do homebrew when I was a, t uh, a teenager, the first time. But I didn't. Wow. I did not succeed though. <laughs> Damn, so close. So I, was, I, did actually, I got to the point of actually could read the cartridges. I could actually disassemble the code wow. of uh, a few games. But uh, I never, I never was able to reverse engineer how the the twenty six hundred was just beyond my my, and only later on did I find out how crazy that system really is. So what so, what year was this that you were disassembling? Uh, that would have been probably around nineteen eighty eighty one, I guess. Right yeah. around Activision. Yeah, <laughs> so you almost beat them. Well, when close. I, when I when I finally got to the, you know when I finally got to the point where maybe I, I was getting closer, that's when like the the, the the, cra the crash happened, right? Right. Okay. And, yep. uh, and then I was going to college too, so mm. it took a while before I got I got back into it. But that's my little sort of formative story. And then later, I'll, I'll talk about later on later. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, Daniel. Daniel. Yeah. Is this okay with the mic? Uh, yeah, okay. closer probably. <laughs> Very um, can sit closer. <laughs> I'll just lean. <laughs> that's all uncomfortably lean. <laughs> we, should, we should be able to, you know. Oh, you could. Yeah. So mostly kind of over the COVID-19 pandemic, I was indoors a lot more and I was a lot kind of interested with something to do. But 
you know, the Nintendo 64 was kind of something that I played with my friends as a child and got exposed to video games as a child and it was marketed to me as a child. Uh, so I was very interested in kind of, now that I'm an adult game developer, taking my adult sensibilities and putting it into something of my childhood sort of thing. So like, you know, how could I revisit this artifact or this relic from that time and that and recontextualize it? Yeah. Brian? Yeah, o overlap over here. Um, originally, couldn't have a Nintendo in the house. <laughs> and if we were really lucky, we'd be able to rent one from the video store every so often, and that was a big deal on the weekend. Um, and then eventually, <laughs> and yeah, it was just, you know, parents saying, you know, stop playing games, do some real work. And one thing led to another, I started learning how to code and, and uh, just got into making games. And I guess, um, it was the Game Boy Advance, which was one of the big things There was that homebrew was really relevant in the uh, early 2000s. And so I got into that, and then eventually one thing led to another, and I got to actually get a job in the industry. And so I got to learn so much, And but the homebrew stuff was still always just in my heart. And so it never left me, and then eventually I, was just, I went full circle and started doing homebrew again. Nice. So we're going to take a look at um, some video of each of their games that they've made. So we'll start with David's. And these are, um, well, they'll say on the screen, but these are for the 2600. So let me drag that over. Yeah. Well, okay, so this is obviously Pong, but like, so what's special about this? Well, there was a Pong game on the Atari 2600, but it it didn't have the original sound or the actual or the numbers on the on the field, the play field, like the arcade. Right. So I, I felt like I needed, I needed to actually make a, a, an arcade accurate pong. Because <laughs> people always want to make arcade accurate things. Yes. So I, I thought that is the why goal. not why not make arcade accurate pong, which is it's kind of silly. I realize, but <laughs> oh no, a lot of a lot of the stuff I like I like to do is sort of driven by whimsy, right? And and this is a so this is a. Uh, this like another, another game I couldn't have as a child it was a, it was a, a, a Mattel football. The handheld it was a handheld game, yeah. and uh, it like sold like I don't know millions and millions and millions in the seventies. It was actually the big thing, and this is uh, <laughs> yeah, this is another thing that people. My proudest thing about this is that on YouTube, once somebody posts on YouTube, like most of the comments said that it was fake, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's the best, yeah, the best compliment you can get. Yeah, so there's a that's like basically a Luckman, yeah. So that's like a, a quick little Atari 2600 D make of Mega Man. So yeah, very nice, <laughs> and it's awesome. And I want you to do more. <laughs> uh, next up, we have uh, Daniel Savage, and these are on the N64. Where is my mouse? There it is. <laughs> so this game was for a competition in 2020, and it's kind of like a, it was meant to have kind of this grand, kind of zany, chung and cheek space kind of feeling. And I really wanted to kind of uh, get something that had just like untextured polygons and like weird shapes and colors, like nothing that would feel like Poker in a Time or Mario or a typical N64 game sort of thing. Yeah, and kind of this like three act story about being demoralized about your day job. <laughs> and yeah, it was, uh, I think in the video, the uh, one of the judges of this competition was one of the Golden Ivory designers, David Doe. Wow. And he was like, oh, it's really clever. You yeah, like the plot. And it was like, oh, I'm <laughs> a normal, this is what happened. Yeah. Um, and this is a uh, Wizard of the Board, which is over the it's your new one. Yeah, yeah it's my new one. It came out uh, last summer. It's, as a wizard. Okay. it's like a first-person voodoo chess action puzzle game. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, it's a, that, that genre. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that sprawling genre. <laughs> yeah. Use the C buttons to control things around. And I know. Yeah, I just I don't know how to describe it. I really wanted something that didn't feel like a good over evil triumph sort of ending. I wanted something a bit strange. So, who's that? The cutscenes again. Yeah. In this yeah. one. Yeah. Story storyline based. Totally, yeah. yeah. You know, I definitely like, 
you know, the N64 is a particular like feelings or ideas associated with it, right? And I really wanted it not to feel like that. <laughs> and this is uh, some of the games Brian has made. This one is on the NES. Astounding looking for NES. I mean, that's for is, sure. I did this uh, 18 years ago, <laughs> 18, 19 years ago. So it's, uh, I mean, it was so fun to do. And I, what had driven me to do it was I wanted to, um, I just kind of wanted to see if I could get the whole gameplay experience of a PS2 game in 2D on the NES. And there were the Game Boy Color GTA games. And mm. They had some rough edges, but you know you can't fault the team for that. They probably had six months to do it and all that. So what they did was amazing. But I kind of thought, okay, we can kind of take that kind of idea and flesh it out more and stuff. And as an indie developer, you know, you can have infinite time to do that. Yeah, that's one of the advantages of homebrew. There's yeah. no pressure on you. And so then this was I decided to do an original game for modern hardware. Um, in the style of the NES Open World game. So that's where this came, and then eventually I started optimizing this more and more because it takes time to your balancing should I throw more missions and more levels and more content or optimize the code, right? And so at the end of the day, it's like, no, just make the best possible game I can make. Um, but once that was done, I was like, okay, let's see how much I can optimize it. Yeah. And so this I've been downloading to probably almost 20 platforms, so all the way down to DOS and PS1 and Game Boy Advance and everything. It's crazy. Uh, and then this is the the latest released game, so this was Shakedown Hawaii. So I, I wanted to take things in a 16-bit direction, sort of 16 slash 32-bit era. Um, it's pixel art still. And, and so then this one I ended up releasing on Wii and PS3 as well as the modern consoles. And I do have a PS2 port that I did on the side too. It's kind of almost, it's not quite fully done, but it's fully fair for like So I just keep putting these things just to home. <laughs> so yeah, it's kind of, there's, there's, I have my original homebrew projects and then I have my porting these existing games to a subsequently older platform. <laughs> Which kind of brings up the question of, especially with your game, what is homebrew to each of you? Because to me, it's it pretty much anything after the company doesn't care about the system anymore. It's yeah. like, uh, we're, we've moved on to the next generation. We're not releasing it under our name anymore. And kind of people take it over mm -hmm. and do their own stuff. And yours kind of live in both worlds yeah. like it, it is on modern consoles but you also reach back to dos like right. dos games coming out in this era yeah yeah it's it, it really was uh a dream come true and, and the the fact that we have we can do physical stuff now makes it possible because i mean we'd all still be doing this if we didn't have physical releases if we weren't making money from it but the fact that we can make at least a little bit of money doing a DOS physical release, it kind of can help fund the game. And with those funds, you can make it more than just a demo or proof of concept. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I know in the 2600, that is definitely in the realm of homebrew. I don't, yeah, I don't think Atari cares about the 2600, even though they've released some cartridges that plug into a 2600, like today they've been releasing them yeah there's been some there's been some stuff going like there's been like the the uh the, some hardware released right yeah the, the, for the that run stuff and some, sometimes people have got their homebrew games on the on those hardware releases too like the Cavern, yeah the Cavern new, of mars yeah the ones actually, that plug in hdmi yeah. and and yeah so yeah can, some yeah, homebrews there's some crossover there's right some, crossover. Yeah. Some, some some modern some modern homebrews have made it into some of the uh, like mini versions of the of, of of the games, yeah, mm -hmm. so. and and the NES is uh, the N sixty four is <laughs> like yeah in the in the past and um, I have a question. Yeah, yeah. I, I wonder if I I don't know if you're going to ask this question, but I'm curious. <laughs> Jumping like, ahead, like, uh oh, would maybe well <laughs> let me know. <laughs> yeah, like what did you guys like? What you, for you few folks over here? How much of the of your homebrew did you do by yourself, or how much uh, did how much collaborators 
did you have on your projects? Like, because I probably should mention some of the collaborator, that collaborators. That is a question. Okay, <laughs> I, we can skip I've, to that now. That's good. Like, okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just super curious. Sorry. Yeah, because because homebrew usually is like a one person thing. It's it's the it's a game that you wanted to see on the console that never existed on the console. But, you know, when you get past like the 2600 stage into bigger and bigger consoles that have lots of graphics and you have ability to do music, it's a lot for one person. So maybe you could talk about the collaborations that you've done with your games. Sure, we can keep it in order. Yeah. <laughs> um, so for the first game, I did most of the 3D models and the sprites and the various like sound effects and stuff, but I didn't know a lot about composing music, and I would say I still don't. Uh, so I borrowed those from Creative Commons. Uh, mm -hmm. In the second game, though, that was kind of the next thing I really wanted to push myself to try to do was figure out how to compose maybe just like a one, two minute song that kind of goes on loop. And so mm -hmm. I watched a lot of YouTube videos and tried to get a better sense of that. Um, and then figure out that, I think, in Wizard of the Board, I was a little more composed there, and I feel like I did everything, but, you know, mm. came on through. Yeah. Yeah, originally, I did everything myself, and, uh, you know, it kind of makes me cringe a little bit, because when I look at Grand Theft Auto, I'm like, oh, that, you know, art is a bit rough, but um, it was, there are so many benefits of when you do do it yourself, because it's just like, you could be up at 3 a.m., and you've got an idea in your head, and it's just like, I need to do a sound effect, I need to do some whatever, I did to do a little sprite for this and do some code and then it's brought to life, right? But um, when I decided it's time to collaborate, it's like their art is so much better than mine. I couldn't <laughs> compose music anywhere close to what they compose and, and stuff. So yeah. uh, the games just end up becoming so much better. But at the end of the day, I still haven't really given up the keys to the code. So in the design and so I, I get help with the art and audio, but everything else I'm still kind of uh, uh, in charge of. Yeah. Let's talk about the um, consoles, the platforms that you chose, and why specifically did you choose like the 2600, the N64, and the NES, or the variety of consoles that you chose to develop on? Was it the limitations of it? Was it the nostalgia factor? Was it the abilities of it that uh, played into it? Okay, so for me, it was just like an unfulfilled, like I, like I answered at the beginning, it was just unfulfilled uh, quest, like, yeah. a, like a life goal to do a 2600 game. Yeah. Like I was wanted to do it. Um, uh, like I, 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 I idolized the programmers who did, pro, who did program, like I mentioned to one of the audience members, like David Crane and the Kitchen Brothers. I yeah. actually followed them in, mag in magazines and stuff. And so for me, it was just like, I, I've always wanted to do that. I just wanted, I just wanted when it was possible finally for me to do it, then I was I was all over it, right? And I still actually want to continue making more 2600 games. Yeah, because making future. a game on the 2600 is like magic. Almost. Yeah, so it's still, like it's, it's still so fun. primitive but flexible at the same time. Yeah, yeah. So I, I will I will be like I'm I'm planning also for like to do. I also want to do like PS1 games. That's my other one of my other loves, and also uh, Vectrex. But mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. Yeah, and it's, and also NES. Of course, everybody wants to do NES. I think, but yeah. uh, at some point, probably. But, <laughs> but uh, I have an. I'm actually working on an adventure game on the NES, a really simple one that's sort of similar to Ease, the Ease Ease type games, mm, yes. where nice. where you can actually where you actually bump into people to to fight them. <laughs> instead of that. That's what that's what one of the one of the main features nice. of Ease that I, I liked, and so I'm gonna I'm working on something like that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so can I'll throw it over to. <clears throat> to oh. Initially, it was just a passing curiosity, kind of seeing that it was maybe kind of possible to do on the internet. And I was locked indoors during the pandemic. Um, <laughs> but I guess as I became a little more curious, I began to think maybe more critically about the game console and just how, what I saw on it and how I thought I could potentially express myself with it. So it kind of grew in that way. Okay. Yeah. And and the NES yeah, was your yeah, first me, big one? Yeah, yeah. for me, it's, it's a mix of just love for the platform, nostalgia, and the dream of what it would be like to see, to develop a game for this platform I grew up loving, and how far I could take the platform, uh, how far I could push it to its limits. And then other platforms that I might not be as in love with, but I'm just curious about, could I optimize this code to run on these subsequently uh, less powerful consoles and stuff? Right. Um, so you take it from the most and then scale it down? Pretty right? much, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's probably the best way to do it. Yeah, and well, I, you know, it's one of those or things maybe. where if you, if you go from like, let's say PS4 to 
PS1, you just think, oh, that's a, such a giant leap. And you're like, well, what about PS3? Oh, that works. What about PS2? Oh, that works. What about right. PS1 now? Because <laughs> as, as you optimize it for one, it gets so much closer to reach to get to the next one. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Um, let's talk about the tools that you use and the way you develop it. Um, like you can make a game on Notepad and then compile it, but what do each of you use in your day-to-day -day programming of your games? Um, do you use stuff that was used back in the day? Not for 2600, I'm sure, but, or do you use modern ones or have you developed your own? And I know that's a leading question. Yeah. <laughs> um, <coughs> excuse me. I think, I think, uh, for the, so the 2600, it's like, uh, not, maybe maybe i just don't know a more modern way to do to do to make a game but i like i actually did program 65 was you systems back in the old days on that like say on a Commodore 64 game we had the amiga with a text editor and then we had a cartridge that plugged into the the 64 and it would just like we'd just download the, the code we'd program and then download the code to the 64 that way so across de across development so it's not unlike that i guess it, uh, although most i think that most of my development was actually in the emulator like using Stella, so I would actually okay. use the Stella debugger. Really? Um, yeah, I oh. actually programmed it most most in Stella, and then I would, but then I had like a, actually originally had that um, that cartridge on this twenty six. You probably remember the name with the one that has the actual like, was a tape. You could actually, oh, yeah, you could, uh, you could you could you could play play audio to it, and it would actually download. Oh my god, I was talking about it earlier today. Yeah. What's that? Supercharger. Yes. Yeah, super, I had a supercharger. Start supercharger. I had a supercharger. So that was my first way that, that I actually would get games onto the 2600 was through a StarPass supercharger. Yeah. And then eventually I got like, you know, my own like EEPROM burner and I was able to like, once I had the, once I had the game made, I could actually make an EEPROM and then try it oh, directly, nice. on, directly on the uh, 2600. But mostly, yeah, mostly developed, most of my games are like mostly developed in an emulator on the PC. Mm, okay. And there was a really, really crude debugger built into that emulator and it, I'm just, but I'm okay with. I'm used to using really, really crude methods. Like the, the, I don't need much actually. Yeah. There's no, there's no printouts or print apps or anything. Like and that. you develop so, in assembler. Yeah, assembly and a yeah. little bit, a little bit of uh, of a uh, higher level language. Okay. As well. Yeah. yeah. So not 100% assembler. I guess when you don't have print apps, you just make the screen change colors. Yeah, that, that's what we, that's actually what we did back in the old days on the on the 20, on the 64 for sure. You would you would you know we change the color, run, run some code, and you would see how exactly how long the code ran because it was like right. X. You know, five scan lines long, right? Yeah, I'm trying to get down to four to <laughs> optimize it. Like, so, yep. yeah, so that's what I use. Um, initially, I there's a leaked old copy of the Nintendo 64 development software that I ran in a Windows XP VM, uh, and then when I wanted to test the ROM, I would send it over a USB thing onto a flash card, an EverDrive. Um, hmm. This is mostly because I found, unfortunately, a lot of the emulators didn't always have the right accuracy, so I couldn't always assume that they would work the way I'd expect them to, especially for Nintendo 64. Mm. Um, uh, later, people in the community made more modern or nicer versions of those tools, and that really sped up my productivity sort of thing. But other than that, it's a text editor, a compiler, and an image editor, and some script that converts that image into however the console plays it. Yeah, so with all these different platforms, it's totally different uh, with all of them. So early on with the NES, I was wiring up my own EEPROM cartridges and burning EEPROMs and stuff, but still mm -hmm. trying to develop as much using an emulator to save the, <laughs> to reduce the workflow. And eventually I built kind of similar to copy NES, uh, a dev kit type thing of my own. Uh, and I was able to just literally upload code without having to pull out the cartridge and burn new EEPROMs or whatever. And that, that sped up the workflow. But at the end of the day, it's still fastest to do an emulator. So if you're doing certain timing trickery to get a status bar or whatever on the NES, you need to test that on hardware. But in most other cases, it's just like most of your developments with the emulator. And um, with more modern platforms, and by modern, I mean PS2, PSP, stuff like that, um, even PS1, if the tools can run on a modern system, the original tools, then that's ideal. And so I have a machine with Windows 10 32-bit, so I can run certain mm. things um, that can't run under 64-bit easily. Um, but when the platforms get earlier than pretty much PS1, that's where homebrew tools that are built by either yourself or the community are going to be better than whatever existed back then. <laughs> and so you're, you're better off using those. And, and that's one of the reasons why we can tap into the hardware. It's like, 
if they had the tools that we have now, the, the generation would have been so different. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, this, this question is out of my wheelhouse because I, I don't know the answer. So there may not be an answer for this. Like, I know systems past, like, say, the 2600, starting with, like, the NES with the lockdown chip. Is there anything like that that you had to work around? Or is that only when you want to make a hardware cartridge? Like, for the N64 or NES, um, I know with like EverDrives and things like that, it's like you just put it, put it on and it plays. But is there any consideration for that that you had to make when uh, creating your hard uh, games on those hardware uh, platforms? Well, I'll skip because I don't have, I didn't, uh, but you can, you can answer. Um, most of the lockdown chips, they used to be a little recycled back in the late 2000s, but since then people have decapped and scanned and made new open source versions of those lockout chips. So. I don't know much about computer hardware, and I'm quite fortunate that other people have figured out ways to produce cartridges in that way. So that's been me. Yeah, it's uh, the lockout chip for the NES is super easy now. You could just, it's a four, is it like eight pin, uh, eight pin Arduino at Mega, basically, and it just works. Um, but releasing games on cartridges, I remember early, there was the Game Boy Advance. Uh, competition multi-card or something like that from early 2000s and I, I'm pretty sure they just bought flashcards from someone and stuck their own stickers and whatever <laughs> and that was that was how you had to do it um, mm -hmm. but now there's so many people making it and, and of course PCBs are so cheap and easy to make now too that uh, you it's it's super easy to kind of make your own or and then you can just buy cartridge shells of every color and it's just it's so much easier now yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, with different platforms, they had different, each platform had different things, like Nintendo on the Game Boy, they had the specific Nintendo text. So even though there wasn't a lockout chip, you couldn't put Nintendo in your cartridge and sell it. Right. Yeah. And so people have figured out workarounds for that now, where you've seen videos on YouTube where it says something instead of Nintendo, because it did two checks, so they swap it out on the second check when it's displayed. So a lot of, a lot of trickery going on there. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the homebrew community. Um, so when you're in the process of making your games, do you keep it under lock and key or do you, you know, send out work in progress versions? I mean, it, it, every community is a little bit different and every person is a little bit different. But what is your interaction with the community? And do you, you know, ask them questions for help or do you offer help to the community and, and what kind of things go on there? Okay, for me, I, I'm more of the just go work, work, work away on it, busy, and then just release it when it's, <laughs> like, when it's at a certain point. But I do, I do usually release the source code and the, and the actual binary for free. So if, if people want to take that and, and run with it, then they're free to. But I've never <laughs> really, I, I, as several of my productions, I've, I've worked with other programmers on, and they've helped me out on certain, certain, certain parts. Like the Mega Man game, the the title screen was actually written by Chris Walton. He, oh, yeah. Who you know? Yeah. Uh, so Chris Walton did the title screen, and uh, it, and some of the music was done by another another programmer. So, um, like the music driver that is. So right. I didn't actually write every, every single thing in there. So so I do I do keep abreast of whatever whatever everybody else is doing, and I use you know get, I get help from people, and and I do get like uh, questions answered when I when I run into problems. But I don't mm -hmm. I don't really do the thing like you know green light, you know, like, like that have, and have everybody contribute to the game design. <laughs> yeah. I everybody has their own approach. I don't, I don't, I don't do that. I just think it's, it's <laughs> like, I like, I like the idea of like, I, I can just do it all myself. Yeah. And I have, not have to, like, <laughs> sometimes the community takes control of the ship and steers yeah, you in a direction I, that you like, weren't really I'm, wanting to go. I'm more just like, I'm more just like build, build what I want to make. So yeah. this is release my, it. My, you like it, you don't. It's my <laughs> game. So, but I mean, I, I don't mind like, like once I release it, I don't mind getting like feedback and like, Somebody said I should make, I should support like a Mega Man support like the, like two buttons mm. and I oh yeah that's a good idea it was Sega controller you know like, yeah. like so I'll probably go do that eventually yeah I'd love yeah. to see more of the Mega Man yeah and, 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 and ability and, to kill the boss yeah well, <laughs> that'd be nice who too. says who says you can't <laughs> it's very very hard <laughs> um, typically as far as uh, working on the game goes I'm not doing it to, as a big or a serious commercial thing so. I'll just have the source code public on GitHub while I'm committing and pushing to it and working on it. Nice. Um, I live in North America and I have a North American television. So 
Mm. Often there are people in the community on like a Discord of N64 people that are in Europe. So I can say, hey, I think this is working on a European PAL television, but I really don't know. And they'll be able to test it for me sort of thing. Um, there are other times also where we'll share information as well, too. So there's times where maybe I've worked on certain tools for certain things for just getting levels compiled or maybe just the way sounds get processed and often we'll kind of riff on each other to make a nice script to make it easier for one another. Because often when you're on your own, it can feel a little overwhelming, or at least for me. So it's nice to kind of have that back and forth. Yeah, so I've kind of, originally I was super into the community and super active and posting the forums and all that. And then I kind of fell down that rabbit hole of, I'm so busy, I have so much work to do, I don't have time to do that, and started just working in a hole. And I really need to get back in, <laughs> back and active in the community and stuff. And um, similarly to that, I, as an indie, projects often balloon in scope, and you think, okay, it'll be a six-month project, whatever. And then you're like, but if I added all these, it would be so much better. And then it ends up taking two years, three years, whatever. And so I decided after a couple projects of being delayed and people saying, when's it done, when's it done, when's it done. I was like, okay, you know what, I'm just not going to announce until it's done. And meanwhile, now it's been three years of like a whole bunch of projects I've got on my, that I haven't announced yet. And Radio like, silence. Various, yeah, various <laughs> degrees of almost finished or in progress. And, um, but I guess the exciting part of that is at some point I'll just have this flood of, here's another project, here's a project, here's a project. Yeah. And, and continuing on with that, um, reaction from games. Um, good, bad, other ways. How do you deal with that? Um, and what kind of reactions have you got from your games? And if you have had negative reactions or I want it done this way, why didn't you do that? How did you deal with that? Uh, well, for, me, for myself, mostly like just tell people that it's like the source is available. <laughs> Somebody's winning <laughs> they can, Tetris. They can, uh, they can <laughs> if somebody wants, to, if somebody wants to, to, to modify it the way they want, then they can actually they can, they, you know, they can, yeah. they can do it and not, not stopping anybody. I don't, I generally don't have like a lot of extra time to work on th on things on requests. So I just, I don't, I mostly can't, like mostly can't make changes, but I will, but yeah. I mean, sometimes they're great, they're great ideas. I'm not like saying I don't, I don't do it because I don't like the idea, but mostly because I just don't have time to go back and. And like you said, you, you usually just release it as it is, and this is the game. Yeah, and if they want to, no wanna, work in progress, no suggestions. Yeah, yeah, because it, it's not. It does. You don't want it to be your job, right? <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> like for me, anyways, it's just like it's for fun. I do it for fun, so it's like yeah. it's like I, I release it out there, and people want to. If people want to take it, take it up, and and make it their own, then they actually somebody took my like Mega Man game and made an entire huge Mega Man game on like using Game Maker. Took all my oh, all my wow. all the assets, all the art assets. And stuff. <laughs> oh, really? I saw it on YouTube and it was like, wow, oh, that's nice. Yeah, so he, he that's did, awesome. Somebody, somebody did actually rip, <laughs> rip off it. Like not a, he did, they didn't make it on a twenty six hundred, but they made yeah. an entire huge like they love that they love the, the aesthetics, and so they just yeah. made a huge game based off that aesthetic. So yeah, nice. Um, sorry. James, one more time with a question. <laughs> oh, oh, like um, feedback and reaction, oh. negative, positive, and how you deal with that. Yeah, I think uh, just at least within the Nintendo 64 community, it's quite small and most of the people there are trying to do their own thing and they understand like kind of, they're in a similar boat as you. So they're like, oh wow, great, keep up the good work sort of thing. Um, and anyone who's really like eager to try a new N64 ROM on their flashcard, they're just thankful to have that. So <laughs> make quite positive. Um, I think I mentioned like, just I try not to have big good versus evil stories or plots that resolve in a good defeats evil kind of way. Mm. And sometimes some people are like, I don't like that. Like, you know, like, <laughs> they're like, they don't like the story. Just, just the protagonist, yeah. you know. <laughs> I, I don't know, I think that's fine, but I always find it very funny. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it's it's tougher when when you're doing uh, like a I've, if it's a full time job or you're like you're an indie developer or something, uh, the feedback really got to me hard with my first game, um, mm. and um, and I kind of have grown a bit. The second game, it it was interesting because I kind of was, I wasn't sure. I was like, I kind of made this weird game. It's I don't know if it's for everyone or whatever. But then the reviews initially were like all over the moon. So I was like, oh. <laughs> okay, wow, that's cool. And then the mixed reviews came in. And then mm. that like if it had been mixed from the get-go, I was like, oh, that's kind of what I was expecting. <laughs> and uh but uh so it's it's kind of it's all relative and, and whatnot. But 
you know, when I get feedback from people generally, it's just like, I know it's not for everyone. And, and it's like, I, I just nod my head. Like, I'm like, yeah, no, you're right. Yeah. You know? Um, and so it's, I, I guess I've kind of become my own worst critic. Mm -hmm. And I, I think all of you work in game development as a job. <laughs> um, so how do you balance that with the games you want to make on your own outside of, mm -hmm. You know, being paid for it. Um, obviously, you can release them and make money on it, but your passion projects, how do you balance that? It's like, oh, I haven't got to it in a couple of years and I should get back to it. Um, how, do, how do you do that? How do you balance that? It's very difficult, actually, to, to do, to have a, a full time game job and actually work, work on homebrew. Uh, because for a lot of, I mean, a lot of people don't want to take, go, program like games all, all day and then go home and program more games. So, yeah, um, exactly. Uh, so for me, it's, it's, it's just like basically like when I have a vacation and long enough time that I'm, you know, or, or stretch a time where I can actually kind of separate from work and then go work on my game. So I don't actually, I haven't actually done a lot of work when I'm, when I'm on a project but that, that's really busy. So there's like, there's big stretches where I'm not actually doing any, any homebrew work, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, I would need like a big, a big break. So yeah. I'd have to like, quit or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, work on them when you retire. But I, would, but I think I, I know. I think I will actually. You know, next time I have like you know, Christmas vacation is a good time. Yeah. To, to do stuff. Yeah. So if I, I do get, see a lot of activity during Christmas vacation yeah. in, in the twenty six hundred home Yeah, that's scene, a anyway. great. That's the perfect time to Just actually sort of boom. Um, I think yeah, like it's probably not good for my health if I'm sitting that much all the time, right? Mm. So I very much. Uh, I think often there are these competitions or game jams for it where I'll have this dedicated chunk of time where I'll say, that will be my weekends and I'll really put my best into that and do that as a little sprint. And, you know, my friends and family are very accommodating with me, putting that much effort into it. Um, and I find often at least that gives me a focused goal and it helps me prioritize and make sure everything's polished up and has a bow on it sort of thing. And I think it's a, emotionally for me, because I think people who work in video games really care about video games. It can be a bit of an outlet from just the nine to five grind and you know the real complications that come from that yeah i mean for me uh after i finished retro city rampage and i was kind of exhausted it was just years and years working seven days a week and i knew i needed a vacation but i just i'm not generally the type of person to sit on a beach and so i decided okay i'm going to take time off and I'm going to use that to see if I can offline this game to run on DOS. And, <laughs> and that, for me, was the most rejuvenating, fulfilling experience. Wow. And that it kind of started a thing where it just like made me aware of that. And um, from that point on, it would just be like, work on a project and then take some time to work on the PSP port, work on the project a bit more. Like basically, if I'm starting to feel burnt out on game design or any sort of real core of the content, then I was like, okay, I just want to work on some technical optimizations. I'll port to PSP, I'll port to whatever. And, and, and uh, it's gotten a little bit out of control sometimes where I end up spending like four months straight on PS1 stuff, which is <laughs> not as productive, but uh, it's, it's so rewarding. And, it, and especially, I think a lot of people, we suffer from burnout during all the past two years and stuff. And, and so spending, it, you know, it's better to be spending four months on PS1 coding than sitting doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny taking a break from coding to code. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's totally, it's a different, it's a different problem because a lot of, when you're doing modern platforms, like people will ask, oh, are you releasing on this modern platform or that one? And I'm like, number one, I know it would run on there. So there's no technical question of like, mm. could I optimize it? And number two, most of the work isn't porting it. Most of the work is creating the leaderboards and the achievements and mm -hmm. designing 10 different banners of different sizes for each platform with your logo and all that stuff it, it's just that's the stuff that's involved <laughs> reporting the, these days yeah and before we get to any q and a's um are there any games you're working on right now or concepts of for games that you want to make in the future for me i'm not really working on anything like, super exciting i'm i I'm working on a, like a, like I have something very very minor, which is like a there there is like a, like I did the Amiga Ball demo for the twenty six hundred, yeah, and this is not even a game, so <laughs> I I, uh, 
I decided I'm, I'm, well, I started on that on the Vectrex. So I'm making a Mika Ball demo for the Vectrex. <laughs> nice. That's, that's a good that's practice a, exercise yeah, that's to just, get into it, that's right? Basically, yeah, because I haven't really done much Vectrex programming. So I'm, that's a, kind of a warm up mm. for, for, for the Vectrex. I'm for looking me. forward to your Vectrex <laughs> game then. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then I, like I mentioned, I'm also working on an NES uh, adventure game that's sort of like in similar, similar mechanics to uh, Ease. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, I have the idea that I'd like to do a, a PS1 game as well. Mm -hmm. And I also thought it, I also thought it'd be fun to do this is this is not a re really a home retro homebrew game necessarily, but I'd like to do a like a, a, a vector game. So a vector game that like it will work on uh, on a on a Vectrex, but it'll be running on a uh, like like an ARM processor. So it's it's yeah. gonna be it's not gonna be using the six eight oh nine, but it'll but it'll be running like a PS one era uh, game. Nice. Which I won't I won't say which game, but it'll be a PS one era game. Yeah. Running in ve in vector mode, well, so converted to vectors. That's all the new hotness now. Externalizing your yeah, yeah, it's like a, it's <laughs> your processing. And then just using the computer, the it as a display. Yeah, the and, I, I'm, and I'm the first person to usually poo-poo the people who do that. So <laughs> but here I am. Here I am. I, I think I'll do that. Yeah. So, but uh, generally, I love generally I love the actual, you know, the actual real hardware running the real, the real code, and not, with no with no future supercomputer, real time yeah. supercomputer help. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, that's so that's kind of that's kind of the main projects. Like that's probably enough. I, like I've got a book full of, full of projects like this like right here this is just oh, full of other yeah. projects but they're all like like barely started or like just a complete or just a, a note in a, in a i think I've most got, developers I've are got, like that they've got just pages and pages of ideas I've got, yeah i've got infinite ideas <laughs> and finite time so yeah. yeah oh yeah and that's another thing is like people coming up to you is like oh you should make a game about this it's like i'll put it on my list at the okay. bottom <laughs> who do you think i am shampoo <laughs> yeah like, like I, exactly like, like yeah. champ, John I'm, champ not, I'm not champ games come on yeah <laughs> <laughs> that guy's like really productive like Oof. yeah uh yes uh you were saying that you created your models for the ntc4 uh which program did you use to create the uh, 3d models or did you um yeah i'll just answer just oh yeah yeah his question was if uh I, how I made the N64 models, yes. sort of thing. Um, essentially, the models are made in Blender, oh, and yes. I wrote a yeah, right. <laughs> I wrote a little Python script that exports that to a display list. Oh, nice. But they're only vertex colors. I don't do any UV texturing. Oh. Okay. Yeah. And so upcoming games, upcoming ideas, anyway, at yeah. least. <laughs> um, over the holiday, I played the switch port of Fantasy Star on the Sega Master System, and I kind of fell in love with it. I had something I never had is before I was born, but there's something just about it that, I don't know, I want to make something that feels like a my reflection of Fantasy Star 1 sort of thing. Um, on what system? I want to make it, it's not on the N64, uh -huh. it's making in Godot, but when people ask me about a new Nintendo 64 game, when I was a child, there weren't any that many role-playing games, unless you'd like Ogre Battle on the Nintendo 64. And <laughs> I sometimes wonder, like, well, what would be a fun little role-playing game to have on that console, mm. right? Yeah. So that's my answer. Two different answers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, like I said, kind of three years of unannounced projects. <laughs> are, you are you going to announce them to your <laughs> exclusive? I, I hadn't mentioned PS1 stuff or PS2 stuff before, so that's that's uh, exclusive. Um, so I've got the main thing I'm working on right now is a new game that runs. The aim is to release it runs, and the aim is to release it on PS1, DOS, and probably Game Boy Advance, and then mm -hmm. there'll be a version for modern platforms too. I've got another game that's made for modern platforms that eventually may be all crunched down like I did with the other ones. <laughs> you, you basically um, demake all your... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> demake yeah, your own yeah, games, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, uh, then I've been doing some NES hardware projects again because way back when I was doing it originally, it was all hand soldering, hand cutting all these wires and everything. And now, as we know, if we watch YouTube and every ad roll is about PCB manufacturers, mm -hmm. it's two bucks or five bucks. PCB way. Yeah. And so um, I was like, hey, why don't I just remake all of these old things on actual PCBs? And so that kind of became a fun thing and mm -hmm. got me back into it and then building new projects and queuing up like five different projects to send them off all at once to save on shipping. And uh, it, so so that's been that's been tons of fun. but. Uh, yeah, it's it's really exciting, and uh, 
there was kind of the thing for a while where it was like, when I went full time as an indie developer, it was like, this is how I make my living. So I need to release it on modern platforms. They need to be the focus. And now I'm just like, you know what? I'm going to take a, you know, a, so a break here and just make it, the all, all platforms are the focus. Mm. And then they'll just happen to come to modern platforms too. And, and so, you know, it's, it's just different, different uh, ends of the spectrum there. Nice. That's really cool. Okay. We expect so, to see some carts and stuff next next year. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, uh, anybody have any questions for the panelists? I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you're, you got Retro City Red Page working on a Game Boy Advance. Yes. Is that available or would it be available? It, it hasn't been because I, I did that years ago and I got it 85% of the way there. And then I was like, I need to finish it down Hawaii. I got to put this on hold for a while. And then I just didn't end up getting back to it. And in the meantime, then. It was a bunch of work to port to Game Boy Advance, and it was fun and satisfying and all of that. But then when I decided, well, let me see if it could run on PS1, I've since totally optimized the engine and rewritten like half of the code and all that. And so now I'm thinking, like, number one, the Game Boy Advance version would be, it could run even better than it did before. But number two, we've also seen Tomb Raider and Quake running on the Game Boy Advance that make an 8-bit style game kind of look less impressive. And so that was that's one of the things, actually, where to me, running Retro City Rampage on a PS1, it's fun. And for me, the magic I feel, booting up that console and mm. holding the real controller and seeing the game in my hands, I'm like, wow, this feels amazing. But I think to most people, they just see an 8-bit style game. And so that's why kind of doing a 32-bit style game running on a PS1 and a GBA, to me, that kind of feels more exciting, like I'm more tapping into the hardware. So uh, at some point, I'm sure it'll <laughs> get finished and stuff. but. I mean, it goes back as well to when you're porting a, like Retro City was originally built for modern platforms, so I keep optimizing and optimizing it, but eventually you kind of hit a wall where, for example, on PS1, you have a limited number of draw calls, right? And so if your game was originally built with 8 by 8 pixel tiles, you're, gonna, you're not going to hit a 60 FPS very easily without all the stuff, whereas if you build the game from the ground up, for the PS1 with like 32 bit by 32 by 32 pixel tiles, then you can just do so much more. Um, and so that was the realization where it's like, at some point, I'm better off to just build an original game for the hardware rather than try and port an existing game. And then the end result is more impressive. Any other questions for anybody? Right. Yes, John. Hey, first of all, thank you for all that you've done, um, you know, making your games, you put a smile on people's faces, um, you know, sharing them, just want to say thanks. Um, uh, you know, covered a lot of homebrews myself, and just, I just love seeing these different products, and, and thank you for sharing your stories. Quick question, uh, any one of you played the play date? And any plans on, so I'm, you know, it's, it's kind of open source, and so any plans, any one of you plans of making something for it? Um, or if you had, I know it's kind of limited release right now, but like, I just want to know if you've heard of it, played it, and just. I've heard of it, and I, I think a friend of mine is, is getting it. Yeah. So I'll see when yeah. when he has it. We'll see how. Yeah, we'll have to drink. Very yeah. cool. It needs a craft beer and a flat shirt. With it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I think it's really cool. I think it's really cool, and it, mm -hmm. it has some potential. So. Oh, yeah. yeah. And already on HIO, there's like tons of like, craziness yeah. going on. I, I just have to bring it up. I think there's a lot of been a lot of cool games in the in the. Kind of in the uh, you know virtual console uh, realm too, right? Like uh, I've seen so much. Uh, uh, what was that Celeste or whatever that Celeste game that was all done in a Pico Eight, a Pico 8. Oh, yeah. and mm. that game was uh, that game was addictive. Like you know, to, and and it's just uh, so yeah. I don't I, I I don't know. Those those people seem like better than me. You know, <laughs> to make those games. Like, I would I, I would be interested. Yeah, to do something like that potentially. Yeah, I we'll see when it, when my, when Roger my friend Roger gets his and I'll check it out. Anybody else? Heard of it? Using it? Um, I don't know if I would, but I would make a fishing game, obviously. <laughs> but yeah. turning the crank would change how you adjust your hat. <laughs> and that changes how the fish come. <laughs> you play the fishing with A and B. Yeah, so there would be no actual, yeah. <laughs> Hilarious. Definitely yep. caught my eye and think it's awesome. But uh, right now, just too backlogged with existing yeah, projects. Yeah, it's crazy and hard to get. Yeah. It's fun seeing some of the releases for it because it's like, oh my gosh, every day it's like I'm going on there like, what they made that, what they made that. Even I made a Rickroll, so they made like a fake game really? and I downloaded it and there's a Rickroll video. I'm like, that's awesome. 
<laughs> Maybe I'll make Rick roll 2,600. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Tell everybody it's something else and they pop it in. It's like, oh, God. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yes. I'm still trying to form it in my head, but like, I guess I have two kind of. First one is sort of like, I was interested in like the, more about the methodology and how you like go against. So for instance, like when you're doing this, uh, do you sort of just like copy like at first, like copy from like the actual source code and then try to like, like understand it that way and then like set like points where like you know, stop points and stuff like that. Well, I'll, t I'll tell you something. I'll tell you a story about uh, development in, like back when I was first starting development on that Commodore 64, and I, I we had the, you know, like we're, we're just lucked out here at, in actually in uh, DSI, who is, who become, you know, became EA Canada. But before they became EA Canada, they were just, they were actually doing some original games like Test Drive, but also they were all, they were doing ports for other companies like Konami. And so what Konami would do is they would give you a cartridge, like a NES cartridge, and they would say, make this. <laughs> and so we would get our like, video, a v VHS thing out and we'd put the cartridge into an NES and we'd play it and we'd record the game, right? As we're, as we're playing and then we'd just have to play it over and over and over to, in order mm -hmm. to get coverage over the entire game. They didn't have any source code, any help from any, but any, any of them, right? So then, so then we would just, and so then we would just like try to, try to Imagine how the the algorithms worked for the AI, the characters, and all the, all the parts of the game. And then we'd have to like just we actually would go to coffee shops and we'd like flowchart it or, or like diagram it out, and then we would go back and then write it in assembly code, assembly like sixty five by two assembly code, uh, and then back and forth from the coffee shop to the <laughs> back to the studio. We did a lot of actually six like sixty five by two code like like in a book like this, right? Wow. And then we would, and then we'd go type, I'll type it in back at the office. But that's, I mean, the, the homebrew was how's that? How's that relate to your, your question? Well, it's sort of similar. Like, like, well, if you're doing a complete original game like Daniel's doing, it'll be a different answer. But I've, some of the stuff I've done has been more like trying to do a version of an existing game, like so, like Pong. Like you know, there's actually is a Pong. So watching a lot of videos of Pong, like I, was, I could not find an actual original arcade Pong that I could play myself. I heard there was one in town somewhere, but I never found it. Mm -hmm. And so most of it was just like, it was like very, very little information available. I, was, I looked through the actual, I got, I got actually a copy of the schematic of the circuit. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have a CPU, by the way. It's all, yeah. it's all like logic. Um, very interesting. So as you basically, same thing, kind of thing, just imagining how it worked and then trying to like reverse engineer it and, and then come, come out with some like basic sketch of how the logic worked, write it, try it, and then it doesn't feel right, keep the sort of repeat. Um, like the the uh, like the whole, the whole like uh, blip football game, which is a really simple game, is actually uh, hard to actually understand how the actual defense worked, and then just like play it. I played it so many times, I never really quite got it. But actually, a, a friend of a friend of, or a colleague of mine has actually helped me help me with that. He he had uh, some insights about how it might work, and all it is all it really is is I can just basically they just randomly move forward. Or, or down. That, that's really the inner loop. Is like randomly move forward or down depending on where you are to them on a but on a tick, right? Like they wait, they wait, they wait, and then they make a, then they roll a dice mm -hmm. and they either move forward or they move down towards. And that's that's their AI basically. <laughs> <laughs> but I couldn't I couldn't I couldn't actually come up with that for some reason. So and I, I had I had all these like more complicated uh, solutions and they didn't look they didn't play right. So it took me, actually it took me a long time to get that one down. Um, and then like the Mega Man one like. Other people, a lot of people have done Mega Man games, and I didn't like any of them. They didn't feel right. They didn't. They just like it was particularly in the way that they, he jumps is very, yeah. very, very peculiar, right? Yeah. And I, and I tried a bunch, tried over and over to get it right, and just could not get it right. So what did I do? I fired up a 60, like an AS emulator, and I spent like two days just like stepping through the code like like meticulous until I found the actual jumping code. Oh wow! And I just like cloned it basically <laughs> into my game. So my game has. Like it the, does like, feel right. The con yeah, yeah, the constants are the constants are are different. But actually, I'll admit right here for the first time, I actually copied the code from the original Mega Man game <laughs> <laughs> for, for jumping. For just, just, for jumping, I'm like this is how. And then finally, when I finally did like when I finally kind of had that basically just copied. It was like okay, this is exactly how it, this works. This feels good yeah. now. Oh yeah. And actually, nice. then at that point forward, I felt really energized and I could make the rest of the game because I kind of 
had the DNA of Mega Man at that point. Mm. So, um, yeah, I, it's, it's like being able to recognize if you're if you're making a version of a game, it's being able to recognize. I think I have the same, you know, similar talent. A lot of people have this talent like of, of, like, of music, right? If you're not if you're not very good at composing music, but maybe you're at least good at understanding when some when music is bad, right? <laughs> so you can sort of you can just like throw something out there, listen back. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> and, and just keep iterating. Oh, that's terrible. Keep iterating. As long as you have an idea of, of when it's good, then you can then you can even even if you don't know how to make music, you can actually make music eventually. So succeed by failing. Succeed by failing over and over <laughs> and over and over again. But uh, I mean, that's like I said, similar how like how like adversarial AI works, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that's true. Doing it to yourself, <laughs> you're, you're the only, you're your own like random thing. Like no, that's terrible. That's, <laughs> that's how adversarial like AI networks basically generate like these uh, neural networks and the machine learning. So um, if you're if you're, I think I think it's infinitely more more complicated and hard. To come to dream up a game from completely from scratch, yeah. and I admire the people mm-hmm. who do that. So mostly, you see, most of my games are pretty, pretty much like pastiches or other other <laughs> other things. So, uh, but to you, who actually tried to make more original games, I would let you talk. Yeah, I'm worried I'm not going to answer your question right. So forgive me. <laughs> and, uh, but definitely, like these uh, games here, like I had a two month span to do it, and I knew a bit of programming and a bit of art. So almost like that, I'm just kind of spitballing ideas in my brain. Where I'm like, what about this? And I'll have two things like, do I like it? Do I feel like that's fun? And then I go, okay, yeah. And then I'm like, do I feel like I know, like I know what I know to program it. I'm like, no, oh, and then I'll go to the next idea. And then like, like with like the chessboard pieces, I was like, okay, yeah, I think I could do that. You know, I feel confident. And then I just commit to that and that's my two months. So it's just like over, 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 perfect, go. Yeah, cool, cool. yeah I, as a programmer, I've, I've gone through periods where I was first learning and getting, getting the hang of things, and then I went through a period where I was known as just this machine that was just writing code so fast and so productive, and then I became super slow. And, uh, and it's, the reason was is because when I was super fast, I wasn't necessarily writing the best code or whatever, and now it's a decision paralysis where I'm like, okay, there are like infinite ways I could implement this algorithm. Which approach should I take? And I think the best solution is, you know, I should take my own advice. It's just pick one of them and just go. But instead, I'm just staring at the screen, like, which one should I, which is the best, most optimized one? And, and, uh, and that's something I need to, it's another hump I need to get over. It's tricky. Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. I'm not advocating this publicly, but but there's something called Balmer's Peak. Have you heard of that? <laughs> no. That's basically, yeah, they basically, you, you drink, ju- you can't drink too much, but you drink just enough, you get over the, you get over the, uh, the paralysis. <laughs> like, yeah, this code, this code's great. <laughs> so no, maybe that's a bad, that, maybe that's a bad advice, but, but, that, but there's something, some sort of grain of truth to that as well, that you just need to kind of, yeah, just move on from, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Like, Sitting there. I, I mean, it is something that's one of the things about developing on PS1, uh, particularly, was just because the memory limitations are so tight, and of course, you know, 2600. Uh, different games, yeah, of course, but, very tight. But when it, when it comes to that, um, I'm constantly making the decision of do I add a data table that's kind of wasting memory? Or do I add some code? Because for example, you could add a data table, like let's say you have an array of objects and you want to have a flag whether the object is colliding, right? And so you could just have a table that, with an entry for every single object with just a one or a zero if it's collidable or not, even though only three objects need to know that bit. But then if you add the code to just like, if this object, this object, or this object do, that's actually more memory. And so you figure out in all these cases, it's like, waste data but save memory or write the code. And and today I even had a thing where I was like, do I make that data driven and add a thing in my exporter to, or do I just add an if statement in the code? And I was like, you know what, just if statement. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no example, and a good example of that is like a pinball games uh, on 8-bit systems. You know, do you, do you basically have, define all your shapes as like lines, segments, and, and spheres, and collide against all these, you know, but it turns out a lot of people what they end up doing is just making a giant bitmap of the of the actual like structure of the pinball table, and so the, all the collision is just against a bitmap and not against, not against like a 
you know, procedural like surface, right? Yeah, kind of like Sonic or something. Like yeah, that. so they, there's, 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 there's that decision. That, of course, the bitmap method takes a lot of memory, though, right? Yeah. Versus like the procedural one where you actually have like a, you know, spheres and lines and you know, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's a, that still comes up even in modern games. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. That decision you know, yeah. turns out between data and and uh, and doing it uh, procedurally. So. Any other questions? I was going to, oh, oh. oh no. yeah. Um, <laughs> speaking from experience, uh, there's a whole myriad of, of uh, sort of skills that you have to use when you're basically working on your own, like whether it be art assets, music, uh, code design, uh, all these things. And there's always something there that's a bottleneck for you. How do you cope with that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think that it, that is one of the biggest barriers yeah. for, for anybody that isn't making homebrew to get like over this big hump of like even just getting your first Hello World uh, game uh, running. And uh, I I think that I feel like, like like when I first started that was that was just a huge a huge problem. Like you basically have to be really really self motivated. Willing to write your own tools, willing to like reverse engineer the hardware, to the you know, to figure stuff out, read read the docs and just like and just try it and try it and try it until you until you got it. But now I think now uh, with uh, the, the homebrew communities that are out there uh, and the tools that are out there, it's actually gotten a lot easier. There's even one, there's even a, a system, and I'm not saying it's like it's like it'll you know it'll, anybody who's really into optimization and it's like it's you know it's gonna they're gonna like look at it sideways, but. There's actually a thing called that somebody made that's called like the 8-bit Unity. So the so the whole point of the Unity, the actual tool that's used in by professionals, is that it's really easy to create something and deploy it to a bunch of different platforms. Like you write once and it deploys it to multiple platforms. The 8-bit Unity basically you can write some little some code in a high-level language, and it will actually deploy to like you know Game Boy, Apple II, like 60, Commodore 64, NES, Atari, Atari, Links, Links. Yeah. And it actually worked. I tried it out. It actually worked. So if you really, if you, if somebody is out there just wants to get, you know, to, to do something and get it, just get it running, that is actually a pretty cool way to just get into it. At the start, you can actually get something working on any platform, or at least on the platforms it supports. But it's actually very, very inefficient. So, but if you really want to get into like actually doing a full, like if you have a very ambitious project, then yeah, you're going to have to like basically. Buck up and get learn how the hardware works yourself and write your own like learn how to write your own routines and and do it and basically I think like learn from other people's projects like look at their look at their code how they how they've done it um, there is like I think I think there's enough tools out there that you, you just it'd be nice if it'd be nice if there was like a Docker like a Docker image for every you know perfect setup so you could just like we could just hand you that and you could just start working without having to get everything together because I think it's really really uh, deflating for a lot of people who've tried to build homebrew stuff and they couldn't even get past actually building, like actually the compiler. So yeah, yeah, that's that's so common. And I remember just being it's it's funny because like 20 years ago it was daunting where they were just like, here's a compiler for this console, a homebrew compiler, build it using this Linux make file or whatever. Yeah, just and, the tools. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it was and but even today. It's still like that, and so there's so many times where it's just like, here's the SDK, compile it yourself using, and you know, no one likes reading anyone else's make file. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, maybe not. Maybe. Oh, you I mean, I can't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's your, 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 your uh... you're talking about bottlenecks, right? Sort of thing. Yeah, maybe. like coping with the frustration of just having that weak point just get highlighted because you're the only one doing it. Yeah, I think like when it comes to a project over a very short scope, like knowing what your game is can help you anticipate those bottlenecks sure. in advance sort of thing. And I'm sure anybody can say they want to know what their game is and there's always unexpected things, but I've always found like, oh, if levels are hard, I'll spend a little more time making sure the levels are ready sort of thing. But when I'm meandering, that's when I find all my bottlenecks. Yeah, when I was starting out, um, I did a very common thing, which was just spin my wheels building this ultimate engine because levels are going to be easy. When in reality, <laughs> I, was a, I was honestly admitting to myself I was afraid that I, was, that I wouldn't be a good designer, and so I was procrastinating on that. And eventually, once I just buckled down, and I was just like, let me, let me do this. And then I got super into level design and, and learning what makes a good level and all of that. And... Uh, 
it's it's a task switching thing for me. So, and it helps kind of where it's just if I start to feel a bit tired of coding or tired of doing art or tired of design, then I can switch to the next thing. Um, there can be a period where I'm kind of a bit foggy because I haven't been doing design for a while, but then, you know, it's like riding a bike, I get back into it. Um, so it, it can help me, it can help you be more productive when you're switching between things, but it can also kind of, sometimes I get into periods where I'm just like, I'm just all into code and I just want to code and I want to optimize code and whatever and I don't want to do design. And then it's kind of, I have to really push myself to get back into it. And then once I'm back into it, I get super excited. I'm like, wow, all these character enemy types and stuff, they're so fun to make and whatnot. But there was a time where I was loathing having to do that because I was just so into coding. One, one thing I would say, one thing I, I noticed was that, that, well, I'm a coder by profession, so coding was the easiest part for the homebrew. And I really enjoyed doing like bit, the bit, like bit pixel art, uh, but not necessarily that good at it. And uh, it probably took like eight times longer just to do the art for me than, than the code. So that was that was my bottleneck, was actually doing the art. Yeah, it's the same. I mean, my, I love doing pixel art, and it takes me probably eight times longer than someone else, too. And it doesn't look half as good. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't look a quarter as good. So at the end of the day, it's I, I was just like, you know what, I'd rather this look good than just have my sole name on it. We'll do one more question. Yes. Kind of an opposite question, but was your favorite asset or feature that kind of expanded your project? Well, I don't quite understand the question. Do you have like an asset or a feature that kind of opened the door for your, your project? Maybe it was something that optimized it to a point have it on a older platform, or maybe it's just... Oh, like, like for Megaband, I guess, uh, I, w I was actually struggling with it for quite a while until I actually um, decided to forego trying to fit it into 128 bytes, which is what you have on, on a, a stock Atari. So I actually went to the Sara the Sarah cartridge, which is which was a, in the day uh, extra RAM that they provided, and was in games like uh, Crystal Castles, you know, on the, that were released by Atari. So it had an extra... 256 bytes of RAM, I think, and I, and I needed pretty much all of it. So that, that was that was probably what unlocked my Mega Man game was like uh, getting past the, the the limitation of just the 128 bytes of RAM. So. For the longest time, I just wanted to make smooth vertex colored polygons on the Nintendo 64, and I really liked that. I thought it looked fresh. And I was just struggling through it. I was really pushing myself. But the moment I embraced textures, stuff with like big textured characters jumping up and down, or like textured walls, or you know, just their face changing, that was when I really started injecting personality into the ROMs of a thing. And they weren't complicated, they're technically impressive textures, but they just activated my inner sicko that really made the game blue. <laughs> yeah. I, I I think it's pretty common probably for all my projects where I, I, I get off a three-year project, four-year project, I'm exhausted, I'm like, the next game's gonna be something small. And I start something small, but then all these light bulbs go off about, but if I did this and if I did that, it could be so much better, and then it always kind of just grows into it. So that's just kind of my day-to-day. -day. Well, thank you so much for joining us here for the panel discussion. I wanna thank David and Daniel and Brian for being on the panel. Thank you. For coming.